This podcast is brought to you by GA Sports. GA Sports is home of the O'Connor Slitty, Ireland's number one hurling ball used by 311 clubs nationwide. Hello and you're welcome to this week's Backdoor Hurling Show. Uh, on today's show, I'm delighted to be joined by Joe Fortune and Kieran Joyce. We're going to have a look back on Galway Hurling over the last few years. And then Kieran and Joe will pick their greatest Galway Hurling team of the last two decades. Then in part two of the show, we'll have Morris Shanahan, former Waterford Hurler, looking back on his career and what's happening within the GA at the moment. But uh, firstly, uh, we'll start with Galway Hurling, obviously. And uh, Kieran, you've had some tremendous battles uh, with Galway uh, with your career in Kilkenny. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose since Galway came into Leinster, I suppose Leinster Championship got very competitive the last number of years. Um, and obviously, we've met him in a couple of All Irelands. Um, you know, one going to a replay as well. So you know, there's just there's, there's, we've met each other on numerous times and um, and that kind of thing. And uh, even I suppose I would know a good few of the players that I, w- I would have been involved with in UL. So um, I I'd, I'd know I'd like David Burke from that very well because. Uh, I played for skipping with him for a number of years. So, you know, I have a strong affiliation to a lot of the lads and I've been on the receiving end of a couple of scutcheons from Joe Canning as well. So, you know, there's, there's, there's all elements to it. But, uh, yeah, look, they're a big physical team, always have been. You know, um, they've gotten a number of us, you know, they've gotten ahead of us a number of times in a number of ways. Kilkenny, I suppose, being Kilkenny in any of the All-Irelands, we have been able to uh, stay on the right side of, of the results. But, um, yeah, look, Whatever happens, you know, every day you play Galway, you know you're going to be in for a run. You know, you're, you, you, might have, you might be very lucky to get on, on, on the winning side of it. And I suppose from my point of view, I, I have more wins than losses for him. So I, I'm happy to get out with that. Exactly. And Joe, you obviously came across Galway in under-21 meetings with Dublin. But they're obviously a real physical side and you've come up close with some of the underage teams. But what would be your observation really of the Galway Hurlish? Yeah, look for like I said, first the first contact we would have had with them was probably in sixteen. Um, didn't have contact with them at, at a minor level, but in sixteen we played them in an Ireland semi final. Um, we'd come out of Leinster having beaten Westmead and uh, Wexford, and awfully in a Leinster final, and then played Galway in a semi final. Um, but that was probably the emergence, Paul, of a, of a new set of players for them as well, like the young Brian Malloy. Connor Whelan, you know, Aina Burke, Young Mon, and all those lads were, were, were with the 21 Spectrum as well. Um, very talented sides coming through. And I suppose that's probably the thing that they've had all the time. They've got very good minor sides where they tend to bring on some very good players from minor and 21 sides. And I suppose the, the big question for them is is trying to amalgamate them into a into a successful senior side. Um, so yeah, look, definitely a lot of youth coming through, a lot of very good young players coming through. But then it's it's trying to kind of transform that into into senior success on a consistent basis. And Kieran, they've obviously joined Leinster in the recent past, and it's obviously benefited them, and it's making Leinster competitive really as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose prior to them joining. Um, Goal obviously only joined the semi finals. Um, and you know, I know once or twice they surprised Kilkenny, um, but a lot of the time, I suppose they probably didn't see the success rate that, that they're probably maybe seeing now. Uh, I suppose they're, they're, they're kind of getting more All Ireland's now, um, uh, and getting get to finals a bit more. But uh, look, I suppose they have the chance to play the likes of ourselves, play the likes of Dublin, you know, um, and that kind of get competitive matches in, in, into them before they're hitting quarter final, semi final stage of the All Ireland series. So, you know, for them now after joining Leinster, it, it, it's 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 a big um, it's a big bonus to them, I think, and I think they're very happy to join Leinster, you know, and uh, they they'd be hoping for more success and probably they have underachieved, I suppose, as as we had said, up to date, you know, with the players and the team that they have. Exactly, and. Joe, they've uh, lost three finals in the last decade, lost a semi-final and a quarter-final as well. Um, so they've obviously been there, thereabouts, but they probably feel that bit more uh, disappointed that they don't that, that they don't have more to show for it than an all Ireland. 100% yeah. Look, and we spoke about that the, the last week, you know, um, those fine margins, what they were in a final in 12, or is it 12 and 15 maybe? Um, and yeah. yeah, and again after the talent that they they've had coming through, and I suppose this, the managements that they've they've gone through in the last number of years, they have reached um, a lot of semi finals and finals. And I, I don't think that's necessarily down to anything except that that fine margin of getting over the line that those Kilkenny lads like Joy seem to have, you know, bred into them that 
you know, one leg once they get to a final, they, they win it um, more more than often. And I just think with Galway, when you look at it, I, I think, and I've said this to you before, that you know, the big thing that would stand out for me, the big worry I'd have as an outsider, is that with the talent that they have, there's a, there's nearly a constant headline there at times about a hurling fallout, um, and that would worry me with 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 the with the talent that they have available to them. Um, look. look that you hear the stories about how competitive the club championship ups is up there, but I'm sure Kieran would say it about Kilkenny and you know I'd say it about Dublin that there's there's nothing there's nothing held back in either of those championships. Tip being the same, Cork being the same. I just think it's it's trying to find the the right blend of youth and and the right players involved to make sure that they have a consistent level of of winning for them um, more than anything else. Exactly, and uh, Kieran, uh, Joe touched there on the fallout within Goal Ireland. Um, three different managers now in the last decade. Uh, Anthony Cunningham, obviously, he done tremendous work, but uh, the players obviously weren't happy with him. Then Michal Dunahu didn't feel he was getting enough support behind the county board, and now Shane O'Neill. So there's obviously a bit of fallout there between the players and the county board. There is, yeah, and I suppose as Joe alluded to. You know, there is stories coming out about Galway down through the years, you know, be it bad headlines in, in, in what going down in club matches, you know, um, everyone can remember that that picture of Joe with the boot going down in the face, you know, years ago, um, when Joe was only really starting to come into play with Bartomna, but um, I suppose, yeah, it, it does show. Now, look, the, the other point of view is, you know, it, it's very rare that you're going to see a county manager last as long as likes of Cody, you know, and others. You know, you see in the club side, a manager can have an impact for four or five years. Um, and then all of a sudden, then, you know, players start looking for something fresh, you know, something different. Um, you know, so look, there's, there's, there's that as well. Um, you know, I suppose with the level of training you're doing now and with, you know, I suppose the the key points any manager brings to a, a game or a, to a team, you know, that, that impact might only last a number of years, you know. And then, you know, people need to change, you know, and... You know, you see it with Cork as well. You know, Cork for a number of years has changed managers in and out as well. Um, I suppose Cody is is the, Cody is, is is not really the norm now. Um, I suppose we're not gone as bad as soccer managers now, but we're getting rid of them halfway through the season. But you know, I, I do see the lifespan of, of county managers. You know, three and four years. You know, if if they obviously get success, they'll be kept on. But if not, you know, I do think I do think the turnaround times will. Will be similar enough to that, um, but obviously having the backing of the county board is massive. Uh, and Kilkenny, that's the one thing I suppose that has been throughout. I suppose Cody always, you know, he he was he had a big emphasis on the clubs. No matter what happened, you know, the clubs the clubs would always be um, would always feel that they're getting they're getting the the support of of of, of, the, of the I suppose of the county manager um, and the county board. You know, so there's no kind of real fallout there. There's no one seeing the other side of it. Maybe maybe that's where I suppose they're lacking in, in on the ballway side. You know, is it a case of the, the county hurdles got preference for a club? You know, certain elements like that can can um, you know put divide between between the board and, and between the and the clubs and, and, and the managers. So it's it's a tough act. Obviously, a lot a lot of a lot of different. Um, a lot of different characters and a lot of different, um, you know, people to, to manage in that. But uh, to do it, to do it the right way, you know, it's very hard. Yeah, that's definitely a great point about the lifespan of managers. Um, it's definitely going to shorten in the future. But Joe, um, Gaul have won four minors in the last five years, and obviously not enough of those have pushed on. And I suppose a man you're probably forgetting about here is young Jack Canning. Um, he hasn't featured yet, and there's a few. Hurlers, obviously, uh, from that. Dar Darren Marcy has obviously came through. But I suppose from the Goa Hurling public, they probably haven't seen enough of those coming through from the minor teams. Yeah, I, but again, it probably comes back, Paul, to, to, uh, to you know the turnover of managers maybe at times too. I know when, when Cunningham came in, um, like he got rid of a couple of the one of my picks actually for the team of the one for the team of the last whatever few years. But you know, I think it, it depends. Like those young lads coming in, I've seen the same happen in Dublin. You know, there's a level of, I suppose, integrity and responsibility on a on a county manager to bring the young lads in at the right time. And I think, like what Kieran said, Brian probably. Brian Cody probably has the best way of doing it. That you know they're not immersed in it straight away. You know, at times maybe possibly in Dublin, you, you see young lads thrown out, um, and they're not ready for it. Um, they're not ready for that level of physicality. And you know, you can be a two or three year minor in in, in Galway or a two or three year minor in Dublin or Kilkenny or whatever, but you need to be minded properly. Well. And I think that you know the whole kind of 
the whole difference between minor and 21s and seniors, it's, it's massive, do you know? But I go back to what Kieran said a few minutes ago, like a fallout can sometimes happen. If Kieran Joyce is working from seven o'clock in the morning till five o'clock, let's say, and he wants to, and he's training four or five times a week with a with a top club side or with a with an county side, he wants to set up to be as best as possible. He doesn't want anything to be left. And if you are not reaching the pinnacle of where you want to go, and if you're not reaching where you know the lads aspire to want to be, and they reckon they're good enough to be, they're not going to be happy in a setup. You know, there's a massive level of of knowledge needed in management. The backroom team is massively important as well. Communication. Look, this day and age, communication is vital. The gone are the days where you. You name a team and there's there's very little talking to players anymore like you're finding out what's happening in the background with their own personal lives an awful lot and, and and that's probably come into the Galway conversation a lot that maybe the communication from from managers or maybe the communication from the county board at times wasn't wasn't good enough um and and that's something that I don't think players in this day and age when they give up so much you know they want to see the integrity there they want to see the knowledge there they want to see the capability of a manager there and I think from my perspective now obviously Shane goes in after having some success done in Limerick and um, the players loved O'Donoghue you know he, they got success with O'Donoghue and you know Shane started off the year before we had this Covid you know interruption Shane started off the year quite well um, but it's a big ask up in Galway as it is in any county I think you know in Galway the hurling public are seriously seriously you know you know so in love with their hurling um, and it's something that they want to see success in and like Kieran said that two or three year spectrum that's there from club, I see it myself, and you know, you're successful, you know, you can't get enough taps on the back, you know, and they'll build a statue of you if you're, if you're successful. And then that one game that you drop or something happens with a, you know, with a bad performance and straight away then that walk across the field to the far side of Parnell Park, it's a, lonely, it's a lonely old walk when there's nobody tapping you on the back or nobody wants to know a photograph of you, did Exactly. And... Kieran, they obviously had somewhat of physicality when you came up against them, but they really brought that on to a new level when Michal Dunahoo came up. Joseph Cooney or Johnny Glintz really excelling and Garage McInerney as well at centre back. And they really brought it on to a new dimension when Steve Dunahoo came in. Yeah, I suppose what, what he brought, um, he brought a level of, I suppose, I suppose professionalism maybe that uh, Anthony Cunningham has started, but Michal probably brought it to another another level. Um, as you said, you, you named three guys there in 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 Cooney, um, and you know, like all all those three lads are well able to move for a size of you know big lads like that. I suppose maybe back 2010, 2011, you know, lads bulked up so big, but they weren't as mobile. Um, the likes of Cooney, you know, the likes of Garrod, you know, they're all big guys. They're well able to move. You know, Garrod, Garrod playing centre back the last couple of years has been phenomenal. You know, for a big lad, he's able to man mark guys. He's able to stay with small, fast, pacey lads. You know, and that's a measure of um, how well how well they run, how well they move. Um, I suppose what I noticed about the Galway lads is, I suppose they brought it to a level where they became very, um, very physical. But the runs that they made from deep and that kind of stuff that you know that they probably didn't do previously in in older years. You know, um, they were able to adapt their game an awful lot more as well. Um, you know, anytime I ever play Galway, you know, it's fifteen on fifteen. You know, you lump the ball down on top of each other and you fight for it. But I suppose they changed their game plan. You know, the likes of the Mannions, the way they play the ball around to each other. You know, even forward the way it plays into the brother as well. You know, it's it's ball in front of him and, and even for you know for wheeling as well. You know, and the ball bounced in front of him, and he gets in hand. There's nothing you can do about it, you know, because they play a great ball into each other. Um, now, you know, it's not to lump down on on, on top. Of, the back line where you give JJ a chance to catch it over here, anything like that, you know, those those days are gone. Um, Michal brought that, you know, as well. Um, so, you know, it, it's like everything, you know, he brought, he brought him to a level where, you know, that I suppose maybe he could have got another all Ireland out of him. You know, what, what Shane's going to bring now, maybe it's something different again. You know, I suppose we haven't got a chance to see it yet, but, you know, there's a couple of players there that likes to Joe and that, you know, he's not getting any younger. You know, they, they probably hope themselves that they get another two years, two years out of Joe and maybe get another all Ireland if they can, you know, and bring on the young lads as well. Because you need your talisman there as well. You need him fit. And Joe seems to be getting good. You know, he, he seems to have gotten through his injuries and that kind of thing. And he's, he's, he's kind of, it's like a lot of hurlers like to tease you in that. They hit, they hit a point in where they get to an age where the experience and they're able to manage themselves very well. You know, and, and Joe is at that level now. And, and they did probably be hoping that COVID will get over and done with and they can get back into it and, 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 and hopefully maybe get another couple of seasons out. Yeah, spot on there. Um, 
Joe, obviously uh, Shane O'Neill has had a good start, uh, ended the league campaign with great wins against Tipperary and Cork, but I suppose Tipperary was probably a complete performance uh, by Galway. Uh, started slowly, but the character they showed, and especially without Joe Canning, because there has been an over-reliance on Joe in the past few years, but the young lads are starting to come through, Darren Morrissey, Finton Burke, Shane Cooney, and even Garrosh McInerney there, full-back, was uh, really starting to excel. Yeah, and look, it has to be a massive sign for, for Shane as well that you know, the players have bought into what he wanted to do. Um, I don't think that level of enthusiasm and, and fight that they showed in you know after a, a slow start, you know that that that's a that's a bond with a, with a manager as well, you know, and, and a group as a group of players, you know they they obviously had a massive bond under under O'Donoghue, um, and what Shane saw now coming in, you know, he's he's he had he had to do without Joe for for you know start of it, Joe, like what Kieran said now was probably right, ready to go. You know, we saw how much of a loss he was last year. Um, you know, he only come on with whatever a number of minutes to go against Dublin. But uh, I, I just think that you know Shane has gone into a into a pit up there that, that that's that's an extremely talented group of players, and they'll demand from him an awful lot. And I think with the, the couple of league outings that we start, saw at the start of the year, they've obviously listened to what he wants to do. Um, he's obviously you know united the group of players that he has there, bringing in some good young players as well. And yeah, look, we, it's it's yet to see, I suppose, Paul, about what what level of performance he's going to get, get really from them when it comes down to the real business end. Exactly. And Kieran, one noticeable thing is with this guy team is they've had David Burke at midfield, but I think the area they're struggling is to find a consistent partner with David Burke at midfield. Yeah, that's true. I suppose uh, Johnny Cohen had a couple of good seasons there as well. Um, they, have, they have a lot of versatile players um, that could play, you know, in the midfield. Uh, Aidan Hart is a very, very sticky hurler as well. Um, you know, Kyle Mannion, you know, th- there's a number of players you could try there. Um, I suppose D- David Burke to me is probably uh, probably one of the best all-round hurlers there has been in the last decade. Um, his stick work, his movement, the way he gets back to the full back line to sweep when he does. And not jumping forward now, but... On, on my team there that we're looking at, I have David down as centre back because I think he's a phenomenal centre back, you know, and he has been for his club down a number of years as well, you know. So um, he's a complete player. Joyce, Robin, my players already. You can't do that, Joyce. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's, what That's what I say. But no, I suppose David, David for Gaulle for years done a job that, you know, um, David kind of roamed everywhere. He he got to three or four points from 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 a game, but you need another player that. Would be more defensive when David goes attacking. You know, when when we had Kilkenny there going well for a couple of years, Michael Fenley used to bomb forward, but we all had Connor Fogarty sitting back, you know, covering in front of us. You know, you need that kind of partnership, and maybe that's where kind of Galway are struggling at times. Johnny Cohen is a defender, but is is he? Johnny Cohen used to be, you know, attacking for as well, getting three or four points a game as well. But David's very attack minded as well, you know, at times. So, are they a good partnership? I suppose they are, but I suppose. When they were playing, I, I always kind of found that they kind of left a little bit open for the for for Galway as well, you know. So it's it's a mix of trying to you know allow David to hurl his game, but obviously have someone there to protect him and curtail and curtail, I suppose, the counter attack or, or that kind of stuff that when that happens. But um, yeah, it, it, a tough position to play in 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 any sense, especially when you have the likes of David the way he bombs forward and the way he covers so much ground. Exactly, and Joe, go have some real risky hurlers and some real talented hurlers when they get into the group, especially the two Mannions, like when they get into the group, their hair stopped, and I suppose that's where they're getting the blend right between the physicality and then some nice risky uh, hurlers. Yeah, 100%, and I think going back again to what Kieran said, there was probably a year or two where they bulked too much, um, and when under who then, you know, they became not only mobile, um, physically strong but look they have incredible risky horrors like you have to name joe when you when you talk about that but the two mannions i think stand out to me um if joyce is going to rob my players now from the from the midfield and forwards i'm gonna to have to start robbing a few of his but uh, look I, I i class i hate sometimes paul picking the best team uh, you know when you see best teams picked you know jj was left out of a team that was picked quite recently you know as a full but like I think if you can pick your favourite team at times, and I think the two Mannions would be on on any team that you pick for Galway for me anyway. I think just as risky hurlers, natural sports people, strong when they need to be, great in the air, win their own ball, 
no shite about them. You know, they just they're tough, honest young lads with great wrists. And to me, it's something that Galway over the years have have managed to. You know, they've managed to produce that type of player. You know, like you look, look at Conor Wheeler when he gets inside in a, in a really limited amount of space. Not, not the most naturally natural looking hurler in the world but again when he gets inside his wrists are so snappy and so fast you know and it's just something that they seem to produce um, and like going back to the earlier questions that we spoke about earlier on why then are we not producing more medals you know when it really really counts that's the that's the big thing is it a an inherent kind of thing that they have in their mind that, that they need to get over but look we probably thought after after 17 that, that that we were going to see them for another two or three years and they probably won more and more and more and then limerick evolved and and that happens in sport as well but yeah look answering it i'd say look give me the two manions on any team any day i'd put them on any team yeah, and Kieran, um, they obviously won the All Ireland in 17 and then in 18 um, fell short to Limerick. But one major factor within the Galway public um, that was talked about that year was only making one change from your previous All Ireland winning team and that being your keeper. Um, do you feel the lack of changes within the start in 15 was an issue to why they didn't get back to back titles that year? Um, it could be, yeah. I suppose it's it's tough to go two seasons on the trot. Um, you, you, when you're the champion, you know every team to start of the year when they when they start out at the start of the season, they'll be looking at that team. You know they'll be looking at the champions. They'll be picking out the faults, the weaknesses, the strengths. Um, you know, and every year to to evolve and to win an All Ireland every single year, you probably need to bring in another one or two players along with you to change it up. Um, I suppose. With Cody and Kilkenny, we've been, we've been looking for a number of years. We've had a number of players coming in and out for years. Um, some, some lads have a great season. You know, they might have the same season the following year. Someone else might come in. So playing the same 15 year in, year out, um, very, very hard. Um, uh, it, it's hard on, on players as well because players will peak at certain times in the year. Um, and when they have it, when they have, and I've always said, you can see one player might have a great, you know, a great six week spell where everything's going flying. He picks up a little niggle, you know, things go back a bit. But that's that's the risk when you play your same fifteen. And you know, when it, when a player loses a little bit of form, loses a bit of confidence, you know, you need you need to either rest them or change it up and and, and bring somebody else in to get to get the fight back in them. You know, to get a little bit more. Um, was to get that extra ten percent that he that he had maybe you know when he was on form. So if if you don't have a strong four or five lads to to challenge in in certain positions in the half forward line, the full forward line, or the half back line, you know you could struggle. You could have lads in there that mightn't be hitting form at the right time, and all it takes is four or five lads, you know, not to not to be up to their level, you know, and 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 and, and that can be a big tell on the team. Exactly, and Joe, Galway have had successful club teams, Port Hunt obviously standing out four All Irelands in the last two decades. Uh, St Thomas's have been there, thereabouts, and the Galway Club Championship is very competitive. But as you're obviously in charge of a club team and you've been with the county, do you think club teams that are successful can disrupt a county team season, or do you think it can be a positive as well? It's a great question. Um, I think. I think, look, two two parts to the question. One, the success they've had. Like, seven clubs in Galway have won club titles. Like, that's that's phenomenal. You know, seven different clubs. Um, they've won it 13, 14 times. You know, you have a great Athen Roy teams, great Portumna teams. You know, you're looking at now having a great St. Thomas's team. Well, um, it's it's a massive attribute to have that kind of level of success in a county in a club. Now, the counter argument to that, Paul, is I suppose you're you're talking about we won a Dublin championship in eighteen and we had to play you know, we had to play on Kill, we had to play the Offaly champions and then we went on to play Ballyhale in the Leinster final. Okay. So we had three games in, in after winning a county final in, in a tough county championship. Um, and then I suppose the argument at some level for some people would be that the Galway champions go in after winning a club championship directly into an All-Ireland semi-final. Um, and that's a counterbalanced thing for me as well, that, you know, if you could guarantee every year that, you know, Kieran Joyce wins a club championship this year and he's straight into an All-Ireland semi-final, he's got one game to win then to get to a club final, you know, and it does make it a little bit easy. Um, easier, not easy, a little bit easier. Um, going back to the question about the, 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 the idea of it going against the county team, I think an awful lot comes down, Paul, to the county manager. Um, as a club, manager now, I suppose, having been involved with a with an under-21 setup, the communication between a county manager and the clubs is vital. And I think 
you'll build respect and you'll build a responsibility within the county board and within the county itself if you show uh, an amount of fair play to the clubs. The clubs need to obviously have the players a certain amount of times, but as a, as a club manager, we also see the fact that the county has to have precedence at certain times of the year. The idea of the club month coming in was brilliant. Do you know that we, we, we kind of thought that we'd get to see more of the of the club player. Um, I don't think it goes against it. I think for Dublin, maybe when Kula got success there, um, there was nearly a hope sometimes that when the Kula lads came back, everything would be okay, if that makes sense. And it's not always the way because they haven't been integrated possibly from November to, to February or November to March if, if they're successful. So look, there's a level of it there, but I think over the years, I think Kenny have shown that, you know, if you have the standard of player within your county set up, and Bally Hale are successful, let's say, you know, it gives the opportunity chance to the younger players and the players who are, who are given four or five times a week up rather than being training fodder to really give them a shot when it comes to in, International League. Exactly. And one matter that's actually been talked about this week, and I forgot to mention it at the stage of the programme, is this notion of Team Ulster entering the Championship. Um, I'll start with you, Kieran. What have you made of this uh, proposal of Team Ulster entering uh most likely the Leicester Championship. Yeah, it's, look, it's an unusual proposal. Um, I suppose uh, would it be a strong team? Absolutely. Um, would it would it provide further? I suppose further competition, Leinster. Yeah, absolutely. You know, would you get to see certain players? You know, great players with, with counties up in Ulster. You know, for the likes of Antrim and that kind of stuff. And you know, to maybe shine in in in, in a Leinster Championship with more people watching them week in week out. Um, there's a massive positive to that. Um, so, look, I suppose it's it's getting the support in the backing of it. Um, from a, from a spectator's point of view, where I'm sitting on the sidelines now, yeah, would I be supportive of it? I would. Um, you know, anything that will further enhance the Leinster Championship um, and give more competition to the game, you know, you, you want to see. Um, but uh, and, and look, as I said, it, it, it gives you know some great players up there, you know, a little bit more profile, maybe that they wouldn't get playing with their with their clubs, you know, in in, in the other divisions underneath the All Ireland Championship. But it gives them obviously an, an opportunity to play some of the top teams, some of the top players, you know. And we all know how much they love the hurling up in Ulster. Um, you know, they they were supported massively. You know, I could I could imagine the crowds coming down, you know, to support these teams. Um, so. And I know a few players there up up there as well that they, they would they would love the chance of it. So you know, you know, it, it might happen. You know, if, if as I said, if they get the back into the counties and and they get the back into the boards and that kind of stuff to do it, you know, it, it's an interesting proposal that you know, I think the public would would, would welcome. You know, you'd be hoping the GA might try and support. Yeah, and Joe, I suppose the one thing is, will Antrim abandon? basically their own county and enter Team Ulster, I suppose that's the one drawback that could stop this from happening really, I'd say. It is, yeah, it's, it's one of the drawbacks. I think um, I think the team, even without Antrim, will be quite strong. I think that, that there's a there's a level of player within Ulster um, that's extremely skillful. Um, unfortunately, I suppose, due to maybe the kind of proximity of ge geography and whatever else it might be, at times it just doesn't work out on a success basis where they're hurling at the top level. I think if it's to happen, Paul, I think they need to have the right people involved. I think the structure has to be massively strong. I think there's no point in doing it as a token gesture, kind of, you know, a circus. I think the players that are up there are too loyal to the sport. I think there's too many talented players up there. I think if Antrim decide to hold on to their own um, kind of county significance within hurling, well then, I think they, they could still do it. But I would, I would feel that in order for it to work, the structure has to be right and the right people from a coaching level, from a county board point of view, you know, it, it will take an awful lot of things to go right for it to happen yeah. and only probably one thing to go wrong for it to be an absolute disaster. And and, and I think from the perspective of management and, and coaching and just the whole the idea of the county boards working together, look, it, listening to what I, I, I've read and saw during the week, the players want it. The players are interested in it. Um, and who's to say that, who's to stop those Armagh lads and Down lads and Derry lads, you know, to given an opportunity, if that's what we want to do, we want to grow the game and we want to grow the sport and the opportunity is there, let's, you know, let's go for it. We can put Galway the into Munster then and just let the... Let the, let the <laughs> I know we have to keep beating Kilkenny. Um, <laughs> so moving on, um, to pick the greatest Galway hurling team of the last two decades, um, Obviously, Kieran, you're going to pick one to seven, and I suppose some tough decisions yeah. to make. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose, you know, there's the last, I suppose the last two decades, you know, um, there's been a lot of great players. Um, obviously, there's, there's only been one All-Ireland, I suppose, one. But, um, there's, you know, there's a couple of players. My mix is, is obviously current and a few, a few of the past players. Um, so, I suppose I went for a goal. I went for James Kell. Um, you know, I know Colin Callan had a, had a fantastic um, couple of years as well. Scale, I, I, I think, you know, I suppose I was at the receiving end of his puck out sometimes. You know, he had a massive bomb of a puck out. You know, he could nearly put it over the bar a couple of times. Um, you know, and I even see sticking over freeze from, from 100 and 120 yards before, you know. He was a big guy. Um, I know he, I suppose, down, down through the years, you know, it probably didn't work out the way he wanted to work out in, in the long run. Uh, I know with injuries and that kind of stuff as well, but... For me, you know, he was such an imposing player, the size and scale of him in, in the goal uh, alone, you know, what frightened you. So, um, you know, he, he was he started in goal for me. Um, my cornerback, uh, on the right corner, I had uh, Ollie Canning. Obviously, there's, there's, there's no better man to have in there. Um, great man marker. Great guy that, that, you know, attacks the ball. Um, he was ferocious in defence, always has been. Um you know, and he's one of those players, you know, if you're having any kind of cornerback uh, position, you, you, you would have Ollie in the mix. Um, fullback, then I had, I had Dottie Burke, obviously, just, there's no going to take him Dottie out of, out of that position. Um, but um, he's, um, you know, he, he's, been, he's been a stalwart for Galway there the last number of years. So um, he's, he's, he's fullback. Uh, the other corner, then I had Johnny Cohen. Um, he started off as the vacuum Cohen there in the first place. But um, you know, he, he he. I know he's moved out to the wing back. He's been tried in midfield as well before. You know, so I had him cornerback. Um, Park Mannion then uh, on the wing. Um, you know, fantastic hurler, really gifted. Um, you know, great at long range points. Um, he's tidy as well. In, in, you know, he's he's able to play the wing so well. You know, attack and go back. Um. Then, as as I said, with centre back, then I know uh, Garrod, uh, you know, has had had had, had, a, had a fantastic uh, few years there. But for me, if if I was picking a goal with team now, I'd have David Box centre back. Um, he's just all round hurler. He's just phenomenal. Um, great stick work. He reads the game so well. He's able to get back and get up. He's got a great engine. And I think the way centre backs are gone now, you know, they have to be kind of all round hurlers now. You know, cover back. Um, great stick work, great passer of the game and pass of the ball. So I would have him centre back and then uh, Aiden Hart on the wing then again. Uh, Aiden, very similar to Park Mannion, very great stick hurler, great man marker. I know Aiden Hart's probably been one of the best Galway club hurlers, I think, for, for the last five or six years. You know, year in, year out, he's been he's been one of the top players. Um and for Galway he has been as well. So that's my my one to seven. I I, I think I've robbed Dave of work on, on Joe, I think. <laughs> I switch it around. Look, he had three different than I had anyway, so I was interested in listening. He had three different lads than I picked. So, um, like I said, this this idea of a best team, you know, sometimes it kind of it comes down to nearly more of a of a favourite team because I'd say there's loads of lads in Galway will argue what Joyce said there in the last few minutes. <laughs> um, okay, my my midfield, I'll take I'll take Burke out because um, Joyce robbed him. So I'll take Burke out, and I'll put Cahill Mannion at midfield. Um, could play anywhere, to be honest. I would have had him as a forward, but I could play anywhere. Naturally, massive, you know, huge wrists, very athletic, great to win his own ball. A man, you know, the two Mannions, I, I feel, are, are, are the type of hurler that any manager wants. You know, there's no messing with them. They'll win their own ball and they'll do their job. So I put Cahill into midfield and I put him beside... Now, again, you, you might give out about this as a Galway man, but I put him beside... Um, I put him beside Ger Farher as midfield. Um Farrer was dropped when I think when Cunningham came in, but like just to try and move my forwards around a small bit as he was more naturally a forward. But you know, 2005 top scorer in championship. Um, I think he was ended prematurely. I think there was more in him. Um, but you know, an, an unbelievable player and well able to take his own score. So I'll be happy. I'll, I'll be happy with him and, and Mannion midfield. We'll, we'll get loads of scores anyway, Paul. Uh, half forward line. Half forward line, I picked Alan Kearns, um, wing forward, you know, All-Ireland. And look, it's it's to be said for a few of the players that Kieran has been talking about and me. Mm -hmm. No All-Ireland in hurling and, ironically enough, has, has won in football. Those days are kind of gone now, I think, as the as the dual kind of player. But had won in football in the early 2000s, I think. Um, he's my wing forward. Uh, look, centre forward picks itself. I've only heard one bad word, actually, ever about Canning. 
um, ever. I think he's the most complete hurler in an awful lot of ways. The only word was my own father saying that it takes him too long to hit freeze. He takes whatever, <laughs> nearly a minute and a half to hit freeze, and it's not fair on the other teams, especially when they're playing Wexford. But look, a phenomenal player, epitomises what Galway are. And you know, when Galway are playing well, and even when they're not playing well, Joe's there. Um, and you talk to anybody, you know, any of your friendship circle, you know, in regards to Galway hurling, he's the first guy that pops up. Debut 212, I think, against Cork, maybe. I could be wrong. You probably changed that. Yeah. Wrong. See, they're off um, us. Sullivan got a scutch in one of, the, one of the days anyway. Yeah. Okay, so just from, the, from an early age, and probably like the young fella coming up now as well, the other young Jack coming up as well, you know, if you get him back from getting back playing hurling properly, you know, he has, he seems to have similar attributes to what Joe has, but what a player. Other wing forward, Kevin Broderick. Um, Again, I'm going back probably a little bit, but I wanted to kind of make sure that we weren't picking all the new players like Joyce as well. So I went back a small bit. Um, Broderick, you know, phenomenal years, 97 up to 2000. Um, some great scores. Um, there, was a, a, there was a day as well, I think, where Cyril Farrell nearly fell off the chair during the Sunday game because one of the scores that Broderick got, you know, he was just a phenomenal hurler, great athlete. And then my full forward line had to change it a small bit because um, I took Cotton Mannion out. So I'm going to go with Damien Hayes. What a player, what a club player for Portumna and what a player for Galway. Um, that pace, constant, constant performer. Um, I'm going to go with Eugene Clunan as a full forward. Um, look, he was probably, he was, spot, he was top scorer before Canning became as prolific as he was. He had that bit of steel that you'd like in your full forward as well. Um, didn't take shit off, lads. You know, um, had that bit of real hardiness that you want and consistently, you know, performed and had the, the bit of stuff when, when it was really needed in, in, in the bigger games as well. And then I know he became part of a backroom team there for, um, for one of the managers as well. So he's obviously trying to bring some of it back. Cunningham, OK. And then the last one, I had Mannion in, but I'm going to put, look, I saw him 2018. We won a, won a Leinster final, lost the semi-final, Galway beat us. And Conor Whelan was just, you know, even though O'Donnell did really well on him that day, He's just a great talent. I, you know, he wins the ball in the corner and he just got one. He's similar probably to Con up here in regards to hurling and football. When he has the ball in his hand, he's just going one direction and it's straight down the throat of the defence. So I'm going to put Conor Whelan in there. Um, so full forward line of Hayes, Clunan and Whelan instead of Mannion. Yeah, lads, a great team and some big decisions made uh, to leave some names out. But uh, a good team. Thanks a million for your time this week, lads. In part two of the Backdoor Hurling Show, uh, delighted to be joined by former Waterford Hurler and Lismore Hurler, uh, Morris. Morris, how are you managing during these times of uncertainty? Yeah, I suppose, uh, like everyone, Paul, it's uh, tough times, to be honest with you. But the main thing at the moment is all family and friends are healthy. So in these tough times, you know, so once they are healthy, everything is, doesn't matter really, to be honest with you, once everyone pulls through it and Hopefully, we can get back to normal as soon as possible, all right, to be honest. And there's obviously going to be a decision made uh, today on Friday, the 5th of June, but um, we could have a return to GA, and I suppose you're a player, you're playing club early, and you're probably itching to get back. I know clubs are sticking to individual programmes, but it's totally different. Uh, it is, yeah, Jesus. Um... It's totally different altogether to going up to the field there to meet your teammates, but to meet your friends as well. And it's good to get out and meet up with the lads and train with the lads, you know, because you can only do so much yourself. And hopefully, hopefully tonight at five o'clock we'll get good news. And because there's talking that the club championship could start in August. And if it does, Paul, to be honest with you, clubs will want to start getting back now, do you know, together, because you'll only have two months and it's probably going to be a knockout championship. So you're going to have to be ready as well. Exactly. And I suppose in some way they could play the club championships with crowds. Like there's not really much of an appetite to be playing club hurling even behind closed doors. No, to be honest with you. And I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be a fan of that either, to be honest, because... Not being smart, below Warford, they could be only around 200 at the games, you know, and a club game there, and there, there's one way around it, to be honest with you, if they really wanted to, it was throw all, all club games in at the same time, and then you'll only get people going to their own club games, and that would sort that problem, you know, but no, definitely, I definitely wouldn't be a fan for playing behind closed doors, because 
club is all about the community and getting the people in there from your clubs to watch it, you know. And um, you've obviously been playing hurling for a while. Is it quite simply leading up to a game and to get your technique going? Is it quite simply the wall ball like most hurlers? Yeah, I suppose the wall ball is great to be honest with you, but there's nothing, there's nothing beats putting balls over the bar, shooting at the goals, you know, because at the end of the day, I suppose, especially for forwards and midfielders, your job is to um, score. And I suppose the only way you're going to do that on match day is practicing in the J fields, you know, and you could, even going to the wall ball, you want, there's no goals in the wall ball. So, but it is great for getting the touch in and all that, but you can't bait, bait hitting balls over the back, to be honest. Exactly. And who was your main inspiration uh, growing up as a hurling horse? Yeah, I suppose, look, I grew up having Dan as my brother, to be honest with you, and I suppose myself and my father were into all around Warford and Ireland watching Dan growing up, so it would have been Dan's teams, like the teams that Dan played with, like Kim McGrath, John Milan, Paul Flynn, Owen Kelly, all them lads, but I suppose I had great, I had heroes in my own club as well, to be honest with you, because... There's more where we weren't so successful, but we were there, there about every year. We lost many a county final, but the likes of Brendan Landers, James O'Connor, Sean Daly, the Pendergast brothers, all them would have been heroes of mine going along to watch them people play, you know. And what obviously you made it on to the Waterford uh, Senior Hurling panel in 2009. But what was the main area you focused to break into that Waterford team? Yeah, I suppose, look. I broke in in 09 and I suppose it was all down to my club, there's more to be honest with you. From a young age, I been had the best trainers in Sean Pinder, to be honest with you. Only for that man, the minute we went into primary school in Lismore, we had a hurley in our hands. There was nothing left. I was in there, to be honest, only hurling every morning before school. And I owe a lot to Sean Pinder, like everyone in Lismore do, I say. And I suppose... Growing up then, I started off playing junior hurling in my club at 15 and we won the junior championship that year. And then the following year, I made my senior debut at the club and it kind of all steamrolled from there, to be honest with you. But it was all down hard work. If you don't put in the work, you won't get the commitment out of it. So it's all about hard work, to be honest. And you said you broke into your club's junior team at 15. Obviously, you're a smaller lad at 15. I know you're still quite tall, but physically. So you're obviously getting belts in junior games. And did that help you develop uh, into the senior ranks? Yeah, definitely, I suppose. Like I said, I made a 15. And to be honest with you, I only came on in the Western final. And then the county final, I came on again. And... I scored a goal and three points, to be honest, when I came on in the final, but I was scrawny, to be honest with you. I was wicked scrawny, but I, was, I probably still had the height. I was like a, probably a chicken out in the field, to be honest with you, compared to I am now. So, well, I know it always helped, yeah. Even probably playing junior hurling is probably harder than playing senior hurling because you have lads just want to, want to hit you, you know? <laughs> That's it, exactly. And... You've been involved with Walford, you've been involved in Lismore, but obviously since you started off, the game of Ireland, the commitment levels, everything, the game has evolved so much. Like You're looking back at old games on TV and it was literally drive it as far as you could and as hard as you could. Now it's there's so much put in, everything studied. Like The game has hugely evolved. Yeah, definitely. Even since 2009, I suppose, when I first went in there under Davy, you know, and I suppose Davy brought a lot of tactics to Watford and uh, he done very well with Watford when he did come in and then I went on to Michael Ryan and he brought his own set up as well but to be honest with you I thought Derek Derek brought Derek brought uh, I wouldn't say a sweeper but brought a tactic into Watford Harlan. people will say sweepers but if you look at times we had more forwards than we had backs at times as well but definitely and that's Derek thought that was the way to go and everyone bought into it to be honest with you and I suppose we got a lot of joy off, off Derry's tactics, but unfortunately, we didn't win in Ireland. Exactly, and you were called in in 2009. What was that like to be called in uh, in 2009 to walk the panel? It was obviously a dream year since a young age, I assume. No, definitely, I suppose. As a young player, all I wanted to do was play, play with Warford. First of all, with my club, obviously, but then to 
as a small lad, all you want to be was the likes of John Milan and them lads out in the back. And to to get the call in 09 from Davy was was something else, to be honest with you. It was a lot of joy for me, but for, obviously for my family as well. And I suppose it was great to play a few years with Dan there as well. You know, the two of us there together. And I suppose it kind of helped me as well because he kind of took me under his wing. And uh, it was great. It was great, to be honest. And was there a small bit of a rivalry between you and Dan when you're both playing with Waterford? No, no, to be honest with you, I suppose, I suppose the two of us are forwards, and at the end of the day, we're going against each other to probably get on the teams, you know. But no, there wouldn't be. Definitely not with Dan, to be honest with you. And I suppose all he wanted for me, I suppose, was me to perform to my best, and because. I suppose when I was kind of coming into the team, Dan was nearly retiring years, you know, and I suppose his days were nearly gone, but I suppose the 2010 Munster final was great because myself and Dan won a Munster together and to win it with your brother was absolutely fantastic with all the other lads as well. Exactly, and what did Davey bring to the table? We see such a passion on the line. You're obviously not shocked from what you're seeing when he's involved with Wexford and Clare as well. No, definitely, and I suppose, I suppose Davy brought a new thing to it all together. You know, he brought his passion from his playing days. But to be honest with you, I love, I love a manager like that. To be honest with you, that lives, lives like Davy. To be honest, because he, he dies for the, the team he's involved with. You can see it with Wexford there now, how far he's after Brendan them. And I think it suits a lot of teams. Manager, some manager suits teams. And I think Davy style suits Wexford and a suit of Watford as well, to be honest with you, because we're a team like that that kind of lives on passion and all that kind of stuff. And I thought Davy was absolutely fantastic as trainer and manager, to be honest. And did you learn a lot from the older brigade, say Ken McGrath, John Milan, Dan? Would you learn a lot from them as early? Yeah, definitely, I suppose. When when you went in first, I suppose you looked up to all them at the start, you know, because They've done it all, and I suppose, unfortunately, I played two or three years with Milan, but didn't get so, so many with Dan or Tony Brown, and and uh, Dan, Tony Brown, Kim McGrath, and them lads. I would have loved to go another few years with them because they were unreal hurlers, you know. But to say that the teams I played with, we had some fantastic hurlers as well, and unfortunately, we couldn't win in our Ireland, but a lot of them are still there, and hopefully, hopefully, they push on and win one, to be honest. And the Munster Championship in 2010, you obviously weren't involved as much as you would have liked to be, but do you look back at that now and appreciate it a lot more than you did back at the time? Because you obviously haven't won Munster since. Yeah, definitely, I suppose. I was I only came on in the game, I suppose there was only a young lad starting out, to be honest with you, but I suppose at the end of the day I can say I, I won a Munster medal, you know, and not everyone can say that, but yeah, definitely I wouldn't. At the time, I, I probably thought I'd win one or two more, to be honest with you, and we were unlucky not to. And it probably would have meant more to me down to a few years later if I was starting and that kind of stuff. In 15, we lost the tip in the Munster final. And if we won it that year, it would have meant a lot, a lot more to me. But winning it in 2010 was magical as well. Under lights, the rain, it was raining in Turles. It was, it was unreal scenes, to be honest with you. Michael Ryan obviously came in then after Davy. He obviously didn't do it as good as he would have liked to him, but even when you see the man uh, doing statistics this year for Westmead for free, you can see that the man just lives and breathes hurling as well. Oh, you can you can definitely. And to be honest with you, Michael, when Michael came in after Davy, I actually had a good enough year under Michael. His first year there, do you know, and until the Kilkenny game, that's one to forget. But up to then, I. I had a good enough year to be honest with you and um, Michael Jesus you you wouldn't meet more passionate than Michael Ryan to be honest and he loved war for hurling and, and we nearly beat the kidney that night as well under Michael Ryan you know but I suppose at the year after things changed and but to be honest with you the passion that man shows he's with club teams around Warford Westmeath even I heard he was up, involved with club teams up that way and the county team and for a man to drive that far and get nothing for doing, doing stats and all that stuff, that just tells you the man he is, to be honest with you. And he's a great man, and he done well for Watford in his short time, I suppose. 
And Marks, you obviously um, came out uh, in 2015 that you're suffering from depression. And I suppose that was huge because you came out, you spoke up and it was great to see because you, you obviously, some lads aren't speaking up because mental health is a huge issue. But like, even just during this pandemic, I suppose it's, it's great for people to stay positive and get out for a bit of exercise during these times of uncertainty. No, definitely. And I suppose like, as well, publicly, what I went through, I suppose, and in 2015, I kind of done an interview the night I got the All Star, I suppose, and it kind of took off. Really, it was all over the radio and the papers all day. But to be honest with you, it was a good thing because I think I have helped one or two people. I got phone calls from a few people, and I helped them out as best as I could. And I suppose the one thing I, in tough times like we're going through now, it's okay not to be okay. Like, and it's definitely okay. To, to pick up a phone and ring someone. It doesn't have to be your mother and father. It could be a friend or it could be a stranger. But the one thing I would say is you you kind of have to talk to get out of that kind of state. But And especially now, in these times, there's a lot of help out there, you know? And it's obviously, it's obviously great for you now, personally. It must feel a huge achievement to just kind of be out of that uh, dark place you're in. Yeah, definitely, I suppose. It's a, de- oh, sorry, that. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely, to be honest with you, because I suppose it just tells you there's definitely light at the end of the tunnel, I suppose. And to be honest with you, it took me a while. It took me four or five months to get over it, but thankfully I did. And I can't thank my club, Lismore, enough. The people around Lismore, I mentioned Sean Pinder there earlier. He's school principal as well in the primary school and every day you hear the bell go in Bun School at 10 to 3 he was at my door at 3 o'clock you know coming over for the chats bringing water over to me and uh, that just tells you what kind of people were around and Derek as well as Waffer manager he was great to me and the Waffer players and the players in Lismore especially were fantastic to me you know but there's there's definitely light at the end of the tunnel like we can see now thank God <laughs> And I suppose the one thing is uh, with mental health is now there's so many organisations out there, even the work PA, the house and different charities are doing. So there's really so much support and even people like you have went through it are there for people. No, there is definitely. And I suppose PA, the house is there and they're great. They're great for people. You know, I had the GPA as well. They are fantastic to me. And Connor Cusack, they used to play with Cork. He was great to me as well, to be honest with you. He helped me out big time, and I, I can't, I'll never forget what people have done for me, to be honest with you. I never ever forget. Derek obviously came in then in uh, 2015, obviously stands out. Uh, winning the league, is that where you think Derek put his mark down and where he started to gain huge belief? Yeah, definitely, I suppose. But I suppose Derek's first year, we actually lost to Wexford in a game below Nolan Park, we got knocked out of the championships, you know, and I suppose people people wanted Derek nearly gone that night, but we knew what Derek had coming, and we knew he had a plan in place, and to be honest with you, being in Division 1B kind of helped us in all 15, we got our confidence up, we won Division 1B, and then we went on to win the National League, which was fantastic for us as a group group of players to, to win together and we kind of got confidence from all that and we had a we had a good year in 15. Kilkenny beat us in an all Ireland semi-final but up to then we had a good year you know. And obviously you probably, you, you're obviously involved but you probably feel a bit hard done by from the Waterford public. The criticism Derek McGrath received really transformed Waterford Hurling and um, I know he had a system and he stuck to the system but the system worked really just didn't win an all-in and that's the main thing no that was it like you know and to be honest with you the one thing Derek said when he came in he, he said people probably won't like it but once once the players stuck to the plan didn't matter what anyone else thought and to be honest with you the criticism that man got wasn't fair but it's like if you if you have a good game people will clap you on the back but if you play bad they, they let you know as well you know so it's like anything in life if you're winning everything's rosy but when you're losing and maybe maybe at times it wasn't pretty but at times it worked as well and it worked more times than it didn't you know because we got good results 
And we were unlucky as well. We were unlucky at times not to win big, bigger games, to be honest. And 2015, probably one of your best years in the world for Jersey, picking up the All Star, scoring 238. Was th- that must have been very pleasing for you? Yeah, definitely. I suppose 14. I suppose 14 was my tough year, to be honest with you. And to go back in 15, and it kind of, I got more joy because of what happened the year before, but. Anytime I went training, there was no pressure put on me by anyone. And I, I loved it, to be honest with you. I loved it that year. And I suppose I got I got my reward after after getting the All-Star. But I actually, I enjoyed hurling in 15. I had nothing else to think about, only hurling, to be honest with you. But then again, 15 was a great year. But the years after, probably 16, 17, I played some good games, some bad games. But you don't belong before you're forgotten about, to be honest. <laughs> That's it. And was it tough mentally for you as players to lose two all Ireland semi-finals in a row against Kilkenny? Obviously bringing them to a replay, but I suppose the first day in 20, uh, 2016 is probably one you felt you left behind you. Yeah, definitely, to be honest with you. We are, like, them games, there are nothing in, in them, you know. It could have been either way, like, 16... We were very unfortunate not to win up in Crow Park, to be honest with you. But that just tells you how good Kilkenny you are. They never gave up like at times. And that just tells you the champions they were as well because they have some fantastic players still. And they'll be, they'll be there or thereabouts in the next coming few years as well. But look, we went to Turles then in the replay. And I thought we could have won in Turles as well. Unfortunately, a, a, a free drop shot last puck of the game. And... Final whistle went, but look, that's sport. That's sport, I suppose. And then on from 2015, your role was mainly a super sub, making a huge impact from the bench. What did you make of that role, and was it hard? Because you were obviously trying to put on to the team, but it just looked like super sub was your role. No, that's it, I suppose, and anything to help the team, I suppose. But uh, there were times, there were times there that I wasn't happy, I wasn't starting, you know, but. The one thing I would say about Derek, he's a super sisters man. And I suppose when I was making the impact off the bench, he's kind of saying, he knew every time I come on, I'd make an impact. And the one thing with Derek, he, he kind of, he would say to the team, you have your starters and you have your finishers. And to be honest with you, he kind of saw me as a finisher with 20, 25 minutes to go. And, and I suppose the one thing, if you came on and made an impact, the crowd would kind of, Boy in behind you and it would lift the team as well like it wasn't about me to be honest with you it was all about lifting the team and I think I'd done that many a day when I came on but yeah there would have been some days that I wouldn't have been happy with it but look you have to park it and get on with it I suppose 2017 was obviously huge he ended the family beating Kilkenny which was massive um, and then to win against Cork in that style and I suppose it, just looking back at the game, Austin Gleeson's goal that day with a dummy hand pass, it was some goal also. Yeah, it was. I, I just seen it the other day, to be honest with you. It was, that just tells you what that man can do, you know. He was a fantastic goal and I suppose it was a fantastic goal. He could have passed it to Brick, but if he didn't if he didn't score the goal, he would have been killed. But that just tells you what confidence he has and I suppose other years... Austin was fantastic and still is, but the criticism that man got down through the years. I suppose the first year he broke into, he got an Austin. Oh, I got hurler of the year, I think, did he? And and young hurler of the year, and the criticism he's after getting since is not it's not fair to be honest with you. But that's just everyone gets it to be honest. But we, I have no doubt Austin will come back to his best yet. And it was like you said, Jesus, if Lena and Messi done it in soccer, they talk about it for years to come. But Austin done in Hurland, you know, so it was a fantastic goal and it was great to beat Cork in an All Ireland semi final, more importantly. Yeah, exactly. And I suppose he ended that previous two years he lost the semi finals. So obviously that was huge to get over it mentally. Like, because if you lost your third semi final three years in a row, it would have been very tough to come back. No, definitely. And I suppose we are kind of, that was in our heads all we since we won't bet kicking he was in our heads you know or since we bet Wexford in a quarter final it was in our heads to be honest with you we can't lose three in a row because it could be damaging for you you might never again get 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 back there you know so we kind of said when we're back there we have to make our math now and I suppose Damien Callan getting sent off kind of 
kind of turned it for us as well, to be honest with you. But I still think if he wasn't sent off, we would have won that day because we, we, we were playing well and we got over the line. But unfortunately, we didn't win an All Ireland again. Exactly. And you came up short against Galway. Was it the slow start you feel that killed you that day? Yeah, I suppose, to be honest with you. I suppose I was looking on with, with all the other subs and I suppose after 10 minutes you'd be kind of saying is it going to go like 2008 when Kilkenny absolutely hammered Wofford in the North Ireland final because they were in seven I think they were in seven points up on us you know and you'd be kind of saying to yourself oh don't leave this happen again but I think the lads saw great determination to claw our way back and Kevin being the captain he is went up the field and pulled us back with a goal and to be honest with you we had chances to win that game just after half time. I missed a goal chance, Colin Cannon has saved it, and we missed one or two points after that. But we were right in that game, right up to the final mission. And I still think there's some referee decisions went against us on the day, soft ones. They go for you one day, they go against you the next, but unfortunately they went against us on our own final day, you know. And Goa's bench played a huge role that day, like Jason Flynn and Niall Burke really finished the game, and I suppose the difference probably told is Goa are there, thereabouts, they played in a few previous All-Ireland finals, not a lot of uh, year players did, Tommy Ryan obviously, he, he had never played before, but just probably that inexperience in All-Ireland finals told in the end. No, definitely, definitely did toll, and like you said, Goa had the experience there, but one of the main things as well, and people like... I suppose Conor Gleeson was a savage loss for us. Unfortunately, getting suspended against Cork for an off-the-ball incident. But there wasn't much in it, to be honest with you, if you look back. And unfortunately for himself, but unfortunately for the team, we are missing Conor because I have no doubt he would have picked up one of their big players because he's one of our main man matters, you know. But I suppose we are unfortunate to be missing him. To be fair, and I and I still think this day was a shot for Ike Harden in our Ireland semi finals, to be honest with you. Yeah, and then 2018, it was obviously on the Sunday game last weekend. What was it like as players? Austin Gleeson obviously caught that ball on the goal line. Uh, it ended up being a draw. And I suppose you can't really blame even your brother Dan for going, obviously trying to argue his point with the ref, because he put so much time and so much effort in. And, like, if you won that game, that really could have turned your season around that year. No, definitely, like, and I suppose only seeing it back again last Sunday there. Well, only seeing it back again last Sunday in the Sunday games, you know. Like, I don't know how, how people can make that mistake in this day. Like, they're looking straight across the line. And it was actually the umpire behind Austin that went for, that said it was a goal. And the fellow beside Austin having the... The good view didn't say it was a goal, you know, but everyone could see, everyone could see in the stadium that it wasn't a goal. And it did, like, it, it hurt us big time because we went, we went to Turles the following week and played Cork, I think, you know, and we were, we were well in that Cork game with 10 minutes to go. And if he had something to play for, we, we could have, maybe, it would have been a different game, to be honest with you, if he had something to play for. And we could have got back into a quarter final just as easy, but... Like, I suppose, Dan and Derek, and Derek did take it very well, to be honest with you, but that's just to tell you the man he is. But, like, that was five years of hard work gone in, and that was the end of the road for us as a, as a team, to be honest, you know? And then, like, even after the goal that day, um, Dan obviously touched on the Sunday game last week as well, that there was a point as well after that that the umpires weren't fully sure about. So, like... That really cost you your season that year. No, definitely, definitely, yeah. And I suppose if it was in Turles or, or Crow Park, you'd have the Hawkeyes, you know, to to judge it if it was wide. But unfortunately, we didn't have it in the Gaelic grounds. And it's small things like that that make the big difference, to be honest with you, because that's one one that's going to be given, you know. And it was a draw game at the end of the day. And if, the, if them scores aren't given, we would have went on to Cork with something to play for. And you've obviously received a huge amount of criticism as water for players in the last two years failing to win a championship game. What do you put that down to, that you're not getting the success you should be? Yeah, I suppose, look, every team are, every team go, at the start of the year, Munster, 
It's wicked hard to come out with Munster, to be honest with you. You have Cork, Tip, Clare, Limerick, Waterford. Like to pick three at the start of the year to come out with that, it's, you might as well be picking out of a hat, to be honest with you. It's all about a bit of luck. And unfortunately, we didn't have any luck with two years. The first year with Derek, I think we went to the game, or we went to Clare to play our first game, and we actually picked up four injuries. And we, Kevin got sent off, so we were missing five players to play tip the following Sunday, you know. So, like, if you, you need a bit of luck, and I honestly say it wasn't for a lack of trying, we done nothing different. And to be honest with you, we have to take some criticism on us because we didn't perform either. But I just think it's all about a bit of luck. And I like this year, you'd be hoping the lads could get a win under the belt straight away. Because if they didn't, it could go it could go the same way as other years. Because it's all about confidence, and if they pick up a win, they could win the four games, you know, and they build build momentum. It's all about confidence, to be honest with you. And I suppose the tip game below on Wells Park would have been would have been the right game to go into that, I suppose. And I think one of the most underrated players to play the game in the country has to be Brick Walsh. I don't think he really gets the credit he deserves. What was he like to soldier with for Walter? Yeah, I suppose if you ever wanted a leader to go into battle with, you wanted the bricks, you know, because like you said, the man never got the credit he deserved, to be honest with you. He probably did in Warford, but outside of Warford, he probably didn't either, to be honest. But I tell you the one thing about the brick, the brick, the brick never cared about getting credit, to be honest. All he wanted to do was perform on the big day, and he never, never, ever played a bad game. And to see him at training, you we could be training at half seven, but the brick could be out at half six just poking ball with the likes of Barron and them lads they'd be playing first touch and to see to see what the brick brought to it to see his um, professionalism and everything even in his later years it was like he was starting out from scratch there's years there the manager would give him maybe two or three weeks extra off but he didn't want to he'd be the first fella back come come January in, in the dressing room like he's uh, the brick is different gravy to be honest with you and Kevin Moore has obviously been a huge leader. If Austin Gleeson lives up to his potential, he's probably going to be one of the best ever hurlers to play the game. Jamie Barron's been tremendous. And then you're obviously seeing Desi Hutchinson coming back, Ely Daly playing. Positive signs so far for Waterford, and there is some real talent, because even if you're looking back at the under-21 team that Beck Goa is probably one of the best under-21 teams uh, to win an All-Ireland. Definitely, and like you said there, Kevin Moore and what that man has given to Warford. He probably played in every position bearing goal, to be honest with you. And the man is still going. And then you have Austin, Paul Mahoney, Jake Dillon's back again this year. Like, and then you have some young players coming through, like you mentioned Desi Hutchison there. And the one thing I say is, and I have no doubt about it, Desi will make it too because I've been watching him in club games. But it will take a small bit of time for him to get up to the pace of it because it is it is another step up. But, and he's, His time will come as well. And, I suppose winter hurling mightn't be suitable for Daisy. So when the when the hard ground, he'd be a different fella again, do you know. But there, yeah, definitely, there are definitely players there. Like you still have Connor Gleeson, Jamie Barnes, Steve O'Keefe, the two Foises, Paul Mahoney, Austin Gleeson. I still think we we will see the best of Austin Gleeson. And to be honest with you, even if Austin goes out and scores three or four points, people will say ah he wasn't great today because they want him to score eight or nine points, but. Austin, Austin will come good, I have no, no question about that. And I didn't say even the last few years, it wasn't because he was bad either, to be honest. But everyone is expecting too much out of the man as well, you know. And obviously at the start of this year, it's been usually talked about that yourself and uh, Noel Connors were axed from the panel. Was it tough to take mentally uh, for the first few weeks uh, for you, Mars? Yeah, it was, to be honest with you, because I suppose we started in 09. So we were over nearly 10 years there, you know, and to get a phone call like that isn't isn't a nice phone call to get. But look, I suppose if that's what Lee thinks, the only thing that myself and Noel would have a problem about, and I can't talk for Noel to be honest with you, but the one thing I would have a problem about is there's over around 50 lads giving a chance, you know, and myself and Noel are the only two not giving a chance. So, But look, if that's what Lee thinks, best of luck to him, but... Hopefully, we can go out with our clubs and hopefully prove them wrong, but it doesn't happen like that either. <laughs> exactly. And 
Could you see yourself returning to the Waterfall fold again, or do you think your inter-county days are over? Yeah, I suppose. Look, I never say they're over, to be honest with you. But I suppose under probably under probably Liam, they probably are over because look, if I wasn't one of the best fifty to get a trial, how could, how can he really call you back? You know, but look, I never I never say. I'll never turn my back on Wofford, to be honest with you, and hopefully I can go back with my club and perform with my club and help my club get back up there, because we we have a great club in Lismore. We're not that far away either, to be honest with you, and we have good young players coming do, through. We have two on the Wofford panel, Jack Pinder and Nirla Daly, and we have a lot. Like I'm the oldest on the club team, Bear Dang, to be honest with you, and... We 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 we'll uh, we'll go back training with our club and see see where we can go with our clubs, you know. And would you ever see yourself going into management potentially for Walford in the years to come? Uh, look, I suppose I, I I don't know to be honest with you. I, I was involved with the Lismore minor team last year. We got to a county final, and it was I found it great. And I will I give back a lot of time to my club, back to the Umflas first of all, and. Maybe then go away, train an adult team somewhere, and we see where it goes from that. But look, I'll give a lot of time back to my club before I do anything, to be honest. And then, obviously, it was a bit of a shock for Lismore to get relegated. I think it was 47 years being senior. But you won the intermediate then, and then won Munster. Uh, I think came up short in the all Ireland semi-final against the Hasker Fona. But I suppose that was a great journey that year. And I suppose... Club Hurling does still re- really mean a lot to players. Yeah, it does. And I suppose the year we got relegated, we played De La Salle in a, a relegation final, you know. And to be honest with you, if you said it at the start of the year, you'll have Liz Moore and De La Salle in a relegation final. I say, swear to God, people would thought you are crazy. But to like we played a relegation final against John Milan, Kevin Moore and Jake Dillon, Stephen Daniels, Brian Phelan. Lads that were after winning counties two or three years before that. And to be honest with you, we went down, but we, Tony Brown came in. Tony, the, the ex waffle holder, he came in to us and he drove us on. And to be honest, at the start of the year, we lost, I think we lost our second group game in the championship and things weren't going well for us. And we, we drew with our near neighbours and rivals out the road, Bally Sayard. And from that night on, we kind of we had a few home troops in the dressing room, and we went on, and we never looked back. The minute we won Water, we won Water Water on a Friday night, and we had to go to Bandon on the Sunday, and uh, we put in our best performance of it, of the championship against Bandon, and we went on to win Munster. But unfortunately, we went up to Temple Moor, and we lost to a Haskra in an All Ireland semi final, which isn't which isn't a great day either. <laughs> And the ambition, obviously, now is to push on and be competitive back at Waterford senior level, which you're obviously competing in, but to push on and win that county title because that's everyone's dream. Ballygon are obviously the standard bearers. They've been tremendous the last few years. I think it's seven in a row now and they've won. But I suppose if the hurling is to resume, I suppose knockout hurling will have a real buzz to it because you'll be getting ready just for that one game against that one team and you'll be focusing so much on them. No, that's it, and I suppose it will suit teams. You know, a knockout championship will suit will suit a team. If you get a bit of confidence up, you never know. But the one thing in Wofford, like Bally Gunnar, are a serious, serious sofa, and they look like they're getting stronger every year. To be honest with you, it's not like they're weakening. But you never know in the once-off game. I suppose the year we came up from intermediate, we played Bally Gunnar in the county semi-final the following year, and we only lost by two points on the night, you know, and we could have beaten them on the night too, to be honest with you, but look, that just tells you what champions they are, and I have no doubt Bally Gunnar want to win Water, but they want, they're they thinking of bigger pitchers as well, but you have other great teams in Water, like De La Salle, Mount Sign, Roe Moore, City Clubs, Passage, and then you come up the way, up the west, to the Western Clubs, and on any given day, anyone could beat anyone, but Bally Gunnar are up there, to be honest with you, they're up there as Probably the best, one of the best club teams in Ireland, the Mine Waffles, you know. And finally, now, Morris, what would you say is your best sporting achievement uh, to date as a hurler? Yeah, I suppose, look, I suppose 2015 was a great year for me, to be honest with you, with Waffles. And 
but I'll, I'll, I won't be where I am today only for my club, Liz Moore. And I suppose in 2009, we got to a county final and we bet, we bet our, our neighbours bade up in the county quarter final and previous years they were after beating us, but to get one over and them meant so much to the people of Liz Moore because there would be big rivalry there, you know, and it meant so much to us. And I suppose anything I win with my club, even a junior, to win the junior with my club, I still high, hold, hold it high up there, you know, because only for my club, I wouldn't be the person I am today. And I'm grateful to everyone in Liz Moore that helped me. But again, I suppose one of the memories I'll never forget was against Cork in 15 in the, the first game in Munster. I got a goal and I suppose the emotion, the emotion that getting that goal meant so much to me because obviously the year I went through the year before and it kind of all the emotion came out. I remember actually running back to wing forward and Derek, Derek kind of said to me, now, now is your time. He said, now is your time to shine. And to be honest, I'll never forget that, to be honest with you. Well, Morris, thanks a million for your time and uh, hopefully we'll have the pitches open and the hurling championship back and I wish you best of luck whenever it starts.